The Napa Valley was diversified in agriculture. A few tomato patches, some walnut orchard, um, some pear orchard. We had to start from scratch and plant our good grapes, Cabernet, Pinot Noir, Chardonnay. That was a long process that was quite difficult. It was amazing that we survived. People didn't think much about wine at all at that time. It was forgotten as far as America was concerned. They had hope for the future but they worked like dogs to, to bring that better future along. As I look back now, it's amazing how far we come. I never believed when we started that we could go as far as we have. And yet we not only are equal to, but many people will place us above the great wines of the world. In the mid-1800s, the rural Napa Valley was a day's ride from the booming gold rush town of San Francisco, and a 49er coming north for some relaxation at its well-known hot springs would arrive in a pretty sleepy valley. He would see miles of orchards, and beyond that, pastures of cattle. He'd see some people working vineyards, but the pleasures of the valley back then were found in the hills. After the gold rush had rushed by, some adventurous men heard about the volcanic soils in the area and thought they held the promise of growing good wine grapes. Names like Schramm, the Beringer Brothers, and Gustav Niebaum. They were right about the soil, and the climate proved perfect. By the late 1800s, there were 140 wineries in the valley. But nature was fickle and powerful and by the turn of the century, the vines were falling prey to a tiny bug called phylloxera. Winery owners tried everything to kill the bug. Then in January 1920, a man-made catastrophe hit. The Napa Valley was famous for its quality way back before 1900, and the prohibition put a big kink in the business. The prohibition was a, a disaster. Prohibition lasted until the end of 1933, and naturally there were no wineries except for the well, those that made altar wines. The Christian Brothers, there was Beaulieu, and there was uh, Beringer Brothers. Outside of that, why, then the vineyards were devastated. That no, none of the good vineyards were uh, around at that time. So, really, there was very little that we had. Around that time, a young Italian immigrant, Louis M. Martini, was living in San Francisco. He'd been a fisherman, but tried his hand at winemaking and loved it. My grandfather, when he walked into a room, had a presence. He had these brilliant blue eyes that, that uh, just shined, and he had this tremendous internal energy and drive. And he knew who buttered his bread, and he was all charm if he was going to sell a case of wine on the other side of it. He loved to be catered to. And he had people call him Mr. Martini, sir, Mr. Martini, sir, as he went to his different shops. At the time, the valley was filled with independent sorts like Louis Martini. John Daniel, owner of Ingledunk Winery, was a good friend. John Daniel was a man of wonderful stature. He was a real leader in the industry at his time and became the toastmaster for much of the California wine industry for a long period. But Martini and Daniel and the other vintners in the valley faced problems, natural disasters, growing regulation, and changes in the wine business. So one day, Louis Martini had an idea. He invited two or three of his fellows to go down to his ranch, and we ate lobsters and drank a lot of good wine. And then old Louis got up and said, you know, there's something we need in this valley, and we need it bad. He said, we ought to get together and form some kind of organization. We need to have strength as a group. And we all agreed. So Louis said, let's form an eating and drinking organization, of all things, and meet once a month. 
We were in pretty good shape then after eating all those lobsters, and I don't know how many bottles of wine we drank, so we all agreed. Louis Strala. Martini, Daniel, Strala, and a handful of others chipped in a couple hundred dollars each to join. They would call themselves the Napa Valley Vintners. It was October 1944. Soon, the Vintners faced their first test. Government regulators, fearing inflation during World War II would damage the economy, were looking to control the prices of key commodities, and wine was on the list. We met these fellas from Washington. One fella got up and went on about putting price controls on wine. Old Louis sat back for quite a while, and then he said to this fella, you ever heard of Leonardo da Vinci? Well, yeah, he painted the Mona Lisa. Well, says Louis, nobody set a price on the Mona Lisa. How can you set a price on Louis Martini's wine? I'm an artist. Louis Strala. The Napa Valley Vintners scored their first victory when the government decided not to slap price controls on wine. And they learned an important lesson. Together, they could make a difference. Robert Mondavi, then a young entrepreneur at his family's Charles Krug Winery, was the group's first secretary. We had good meals, good wines, and we banded together, had a good time, but also we began to talk about promotional activities, Napa Valley, and that's what really created Napa Valley as being distinct and different from anyone else. Early on, the Vintners recognized the power of getting the word out about Napa and looked for opportunities wherever they could. One summer, the Vintners entertained Harvard alumni. We had about a thousand people at that time, and this was amazing. We knew that if we get a group like that, that this was international because here you had all the Harvard graduates, and we were excited about that. The Vintners also bust in thousands of visitors from a General Electric convention in San Francisco. There was about 2,000 people there at that time. And I remember we were worried sick about where can we put them for toilet facilities and things like that. It's a big undertaking. We had to have the whole community work with us, and that's what we did. The Vintners were learning to mix marketing and philanthropy. When they heard the famed San Francisco cable cars needed repairs, they jumped into action. We thought, well, you know, San Francisco is known the world over for its cable cars. And we thought, whoa, how wonderful it is to celebrate the harvest and make it very colorful. And that's exactly what took place. And it was very, very successful. These are the small things that people don't realize. But if you work in harmony together, it makes a difference in day and night. And people love to see that. Vintners in the Napa Valley were learning that wine went well with style and celebrity, and soon some pretty famous people were coming to the valley and enjoying the fruit of its vines. Clark Gable, Carol Lombard, and Charles Lawton were all up here, probably 40 or 50 more uh, who were here in a kind of a formal sense that, that they were here long enough to do a movie. And association founders, John Daniel, Louis Martini and Robert Mondavi were always willing to teach visiting stars the secrets of making wine. We realized that by having these celebrities, it couldn't do anything but help Napa Valley. Even some of the vintners got the showbiz bug, like Brother Timothy, who stumped a panel of judges trying to identify the real winemaking monk on the TV game show to tell the truth. Newcomers were showing interest in old wineries and began a movement to bring them into the modern age. The old sign at the mouth of the valley that once listed each member of the Napa Vintners could no longer hold all their names, so Robert Louis Stevenson's words were borrowed to convey the passion the Vintners shared. The Vintners knew they were once and future farmers. With the influx of newcomers to the valley and the wine industry, old timers and newcomers alike realized the need to protect Napa from creeping development. 
Jack and Jamie Davies arrived in the mid-1960s and began reviving Jacob Schramm's old winery. They soon joined others to protect the land with an agricultural preserve. All of the developments in the past 30 years have been possible as a result of the creation of the Ag Preserve. In the early days, going all the way back to 1968 when the Ag Preserve was established, uh, we viewed agriculture as a way of, um, of stopping the kind of urbanization or suburbanization that impacted uh, so many of the other counties that surround uh, San Francisco. And we saw agriculture, grape growing, as a way of preserving open space. Even people who didn't support the wine industry as such saw that their way of life, that the valley floor would be radically changed and they were willing to support the ag formation of the Ag Preserve. The Agricultural Preserve made grape growers and vintners realize they were business people and stewards of the land. It set the stage for future environmental efforts. By the 70s, new members were joining the Napa Vintners each year. The atmosphere was still social and, when it came to business, cooperative. They were all good friends and supporters of one another, and that was what really mattered at that time. My first recollection of the Napa Valley Vintners was as a brand new member, a young winemaker who was just in awe of everyone in the room. All of a sudden, somebody said, hey, kid, and there sat Louis Strala, and he said, come over here. I want you to sit next to me because all these new faces that are showing up, I don't know who they are, you can tell me who they are, and I'll tell you the history of the Napa Valley. It was 1973, nearly three decades after the association was born. Grapes had recently surpassed cattle as the largest agricultural product in the county. There were 30 members of the Napa Vintners, and the group was garnering notice. The following year, a writer for the San Francisco Examiner wrangled an invitation into what he called Lunch with the Brotherhood. The Napa Valley Vintners at the time was a, um, a social group more than anything. Yeah, some PR, certainly some discussions on laws, regulations, what's new in Washington or Sacramento was more, even more important to us at the time. And uh, otherwise it was just good food and of course at the end of the meal came dessert and brandy. And I tell you, <laughs> you were a happy camper when you left that meeting. In 1976, the world would learn about the little valley that could. At a blind tasting in Paris with French judges, the Napa Valley was pitted against the best of France. When the rankings were revealed, a bomb exploded in the wine world. Time magazine reported the winners were two wines from the Napa Valley, a Chardonnay from Chateau Montalena and a Cabernet Sauvignon from Stag's Leap Wine Cellars. Both are now part of the Smithsonian Institution's History of Wine Collection in Washington, D.C. It was a rising tide that floated many ships, and uh, we all got confidence. We all obtained a new sense of mission once that happened. We knew we had the right material. We knew we were in the right place. We knew we had the skills, and uh, the Paris tasting sort of put a seal of approval on that from the French themselves. The Vintners were in the big leagues now, and they pushed the government to grant Napa the status of an appellation, which would indicate to consumers a regional identity for the wine in the bottle. They believed the place, Napa Valley, was as important as whether it was a Cabernet or a Chardonnay. The naming of the Napa Valley as a viticultural area was very important. Uh, we thought we had a treasure here. We thought, in fact, that we had a national treasure. The area, the soil, the climate, and all played a very important part, and that was important to emphasize and to let the world know that we are unique. Napa Valley is a unique spot in the world where it, there's nothing like it. By 1980, the Vintners wanted to make a statement about their commitment to the valley. So one day, a small group of friends got together at the Robert Mondavi Winery and decided to hold a charity wine auction model after one in Burgundy, France. Bob Mondavi said, this is what we've been looking for all these years. Your father and I, this is what we, we hoped for. We, we kept searching for a way to promote the wines of Napa Valley in a unique way, in a way that would be memorable. The first auction 
took place in June 1981. It was an enormously hot day, and when the afternoon um, came and the wines were there, it was so very hot, so that the samples were not cool and delicious, but rather extremely warm. The temperature in the tent was somewhere around 110 to 113 degrees. We certainly went into a full court press to go out and find every bottle of water that was located anywhere in Napa County. And our auctioneer, who was the lead auctioneer from Christie's in London, arrived to do the auction um, predictably in a coat and tie and um, dressed beautifully. And as the day wore on, the jacket came off, the tie came off, and if one were to peek under the tablecloth, one would have found that his feet were reposited in a large tub of ice water. But despite the glitches, the Vintners raised $140,000 and donated it to the county's two hospitals. I think it's the women that pulled it off because they got together, they worked, they got the volunteers, they were creative. And I think because of these very, very visionary ladies that the auction succeeded. Bob Mondavi and Margaret and I all felt that it was extremely important that it be an annual event, that it be set at a certain time on the calendar so that collectors would just automatically write it on their calendar every year. Scene 1A, take two. By the 1990s, the Vintners' marketing activities began to focus worldwide attention on the uniqueness of this small valley. Hi, I'm Dick Ward from Sainsbury Winery. The, the group, now a formal trade association, was in high gear. Working radio. committees were focusing on domestic and international marketing programs in which the vintners would travel the U.S. and the world with their wines. This program has been really good for individual wineries, especially smaller ones, because as a smaller winery, you don't have the resources to make the contacts, set up the venues, even attract the attention of the trade or consumers in a, in a particular market. And by working together, I think we have a greater draw to get that attention. Since the late 90s, the Vintners have also worked to provide more housing for farm workers, especially the seasonal workers from Mexico who come each harvest. Since 1995, Vintners have chipped in operating funds for farm worker camps and procured land for a new camp. In 2001, they succeeded in getting state legislation enacted so they could tax themselves to pay for farm worker housing. I think all in all, our experience um, uh, with the farm worker housing um, issue demonstrates what consensus building can do. And that's what the Napa Valley Vintners are all about. Is, um, is finding a consensus of the members, attacking issues in, that affect our community, and uh, resolving those issues. And I think that this is just an extraordinary example. And the association continues to see its members as shepherds of the land. We want to be able to keep doing what we're doing, and we want it to be healthy. We want it to be sustainable. And that has to be economic viability, it has to be environmentally viable, it has to be socially responsible. And it, it, it really does um, encapsulate a, a, a lot of the, uh, the elements that we, that we talk about when we talk about integrating ourselves into a community. We need to restore creeks, we need to look at the watershed and take care of that, we need to protect the hillsides, we need to have some sort of semblance of order in terms of the environment here and all the issues that pertain to it. In 2000, the Vintners Association sponsored a state law that forbids Vintners from using the words Napa or Napa Valley in their brand names unless at least 75% of the grapes in the bottle come from Napa. When people promote wines as being Napa Valley, when in fact the grapes are coming from other regions, whether it be the Central Valley or the Central Coast, uh, we see that we've, we believe that that's uh, a, an attempt at consumer fraud. And so it became necessary for us to uh, protect the wine so that consumers know when they see Napa Valley on a bottle of wine that in fact the grapes come from the Napa Valley. <laughs> The Vintners' success at the turn of the century extended beyond the reputation of their wines to their charitable efforts, 
have 52,000 here, 55,000, 58,000, 60,000, 62, 65, 68, 70 here, 72, 75, 78. The auction that started in 1981 exploded, raising nine and a half million dollars in the year 2000. It has become the world's biggest charity wine event and allows the vintners to support a wide range of beneficiaries in the valley where every penny is spent. It's going to the front at $100,000 sold. We have been able to give $37 million in those 20 years plus to wonderful, wonderful organizations that help the community. As the hospitals, the, the uh, Queen of the Valley Hospital in Napa, the, uh, the health center in St. Helena. In 2002, a much needed health care center was built with funds from the auction, which also supports dozens of other nonprofit groups. It's really a win-win. It's one of those rare and wonderful occasions where um, a very large-scale auction, which is uh, high visibility for the, the wines of Napa Valley, shows us off to very, very good effect in an, in an, on an international stage, also raises millions of dollars for, um, for the community. What began in 1944 has become today a fully staffed professional industry association, offering strategically developed marketing, public relations, and industry issues programs that benefit even the smallest of member wineries. And the professional camaraderie carries on too. Today I'd say that the Napa Valley Vintners is a professional eating and drinking society. We have a meeting first, then we start drinking and eating. What that organization, even 60 years ago, demonstrated was a willingness to share ideas and to share concepts. And many people would tell you that the Napa Valley has leapfrogged over other appellations because of that willingness to work together that was demonstrated so long ago. The visionaries of yesterday worked to build the Napa Valley into a great wine region. Today's visionaries, the more than 220 members of the Napa Valley Vintners Association, continue that legacy by presenting a unified voice and promoting Napa Valley as one of the finest wine-growing regions in the world. Thank you.